God bless you all. You could hear me? Amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. That worship was <laughs> tremendous. I can't wait to hear what God's going to bring today. <laughs> I'm going to, we're going to, our offerings and tithes, it's going to be, I'm going to say in Spanish because in English, Deuteronomio 28. And I'm going to read one and two in the living translation. And it says, if you fully obey the Lord, your God, and carefully keep all his command that I am giving you today, the Lord your God will set you high up above all the nations of the world. You will experience all these blessings if you obey the Lord your God. And the word, I said the key word here is obey. If you obey the Lord in your blessings, and when you receive that blessing, you're going to give those tithes, those offerings with an open heart. Because it, and if you continue reading um, the chapter 28, it says it will bless your home, the town, your flat, your lambs, everything. That's not the, he's not going to bless just half of it. He's going to bless it all. So today, our offerings, our tithes, we're going to give it with an open heart and we're going to bless those who bless to others. Our blessing, we're going to give it to the storehouse, but that storehouse is going to bless others. But when we do that key word, obey the Lord. So we give you thanks, God. Thank you for all the blessings. And we're going to bless today with our offerings to you, God. And only you, God, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Our apostle is. God bless you all. Welcome, everyone. Welcome. We're going to go right into the word. I don't want to waste time on anything else. Um, I want to just get into the word. I want to get into Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. And this was the commissioning of Isaiah and how he was commissioned into doing what God had called him to do. And I'm going to read it. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full with, of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among the people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and sin atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. Thank you, Lord. The commissioning, um, when we look at the word, it is, that you have a duty, you have a responsibility. There's a commissioning of pastors, there's a commissioning of leaders, and what we have made it out to be is like a service, a certificate, credentials. We've made it into something 
that it is some officiated ceremony. And this was the ceremony, the, the, the ceremony of Isaiah. And we're going to see how that compares to what he's calling us to do now and day. The commission from Jesus has been interpreted by evangelicals, a meaning that his followers have a duty to go make disciples, teach, and baptize. That is like the great commission. When you have a mission, you have three options. Three. You can go, you can send someone, or you can disobey. In other words, you can obey or you can disobey. Pretty clear when it comes to commission. It is a charge. It is to give orders. It's to give an order or instruction to a specific person that they have a responsibility before the Lord first. In this commission, we see that the guilt and the shame and the sins were burnt off. One thing that Isaiah recognized, he recognized his unclean lips. Can you recognize your unclean lips? Can you recognize the unclean lips of those around you, who you are surrounded with? And can you see the power of God burn it all away? Can you see God take care of it? And his unclean lips, if you look at it, his unclean lips and even his surroundings did not inhibit him from seeing the vision of the Lord. He recognized his uncleanliness after he saw the vision of the Lord. So seeing God and seeing what he has for you and seeing what he desires and getting visions and dreams all can still come way before you're going to feel any conviction. Just wanted to share that. In it with that verse seven and eight, it says, he touched my lips with the burning coal and said, this has touched your lips and now your guilt is gone and your sins are forgiven. Then I heard the Lord say, whom shall I send? Who will be our messenger? It's a different version. And I answered, I will go send me. Different version. Burning off everything in the exterior. What does he have to burn off on you? What does he have to burn off on me? What are the things he has to burn? If we look at burning of the lips, it's what we express. It's what we say. It's the things we either come into agreement with or what we believe. The burning coal was taken from the altar and applied to the mouth with the assurance. There's a guarantee. There's an assurance that your guilt has been taken away. There's an assurance that all your sins have been forgiven. And that is the assurance Jesus Christ gives us at the cross. There's an assurance that your sins are forgiven. There's an assurance that all shame and guilt is gone. There's, an, there's a guarantee by blood. You just have to believe it. Proverbs 18.21 says, power of tongue. You have power in your tongue. You have power to speak death, or you have power to speak life. And then it says, and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. Do you love death and that's all you speak and you're eating that fruit? Or do you love life? And are you eating the fruit of life? Do you love life enough that that's all you speak? From morning to night. Do you choose to speak death or do you speak death on life? Proverbs 26, 21 says, without wood, a fire goes out. Without gossip, quarreling stops. I want you to see the trend. Charcoal keeps the embers growing, glowing. Wood keeps the fire burning. A troublemaker keeps the arguments alive. It is up to you. Do you want to keep death alive in your life? Think about that, death alive in your life. Or do you want to keep life? Do you want to speak life? Do you want to keep that burning? Do you want to keep that wood, that fire, that, that, that thing that sustains you, which is the Lord, keeping that alive in your speech? 
in your speaking. When the coal touches your lips, it's like a branding. Because if you look at coal, coal doesn't turn into a fire. It doesn't give you a flame. It just releases heat enough to burn things, enough to cook, enough to do things with. And in this case, when the Lord brands our lips, he's branding it with forgiveness. He's branding it with freedom. He's branding it with life. He's branding it with himself. And so for us to speak anything other than life, it's to say he didn't brand us. He says, now your guilt is gone. It was immediate. At the branding, it's an immediate thing. It doesn't mean you're not going to battle in your mind, you battle in your flesh. It does not mean that. What it means is he doesn't want you to battle here and here. He doesn't want you to battle in your heart and in your mouth. Stop speaking guilt and shame. Your sins are forgiven. Stop mentioning the sins that you committed so long ago. You're living from a place of guilt, of shame, and sin. Guilt. I'm just going to read you some stuff. Guilt is caused when a particular principle is violated or law broken. We also tend to feel guilty when we have not lived up to the expectations or standards that we or the Lord have set for ourselves. If we believe that we should have behaved differently or we ought to have done better, then we will likely always feel guilt. There will always be a guilt. If we're not living to what was expected, if you were supposed to be some great apostle or some great doctor and you, you're going to be an attorney, you're going to be a teacher, you're going to be this, and you never lived up to it, you will always feel a guilt because you never attained what was expected of you from others, yourself, or you know what the Lord expects from you. So you live with a spirit of guilt on top of you because you haven't attained what you thought you should have attained. Although genuine guilt is a healthy emotion, Satan can pervert it by turning it from remorseful awareness of having done something wrong to self-reproach. You get to a place where you start rejecting your own self. You start cursing your own self. You start using the mouthpiece of God to hurt your own self. You don't even need anybody else's help. You do it yourself. When this happens, we know that Satan has perverted a healthy emotion into a deadly weapon. He used what was what should have been a stepping stone for you to attain what God wanted against you as a weapon. Our, it says overcoming guilt and shame. When, when this comes to you, I want you to read um, Psalm 51, 1 through 12. This is a prayer in the word. And I'm using this. This came from Cindy Trim's book that we all tend to have because I use it a lot. So I'm going to read Psalm 51. And, and this gives us strategy. When we are dealing with guilt, this is what we, it says, a Psalm of David. And I want you to hear it. I, I, you can write it down in your notes, but I want you to hear it. It says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing, according to compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth and sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in the secret place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. When you get to a place of shame and guilt, I want you to look at prayers like that that show you that from the womb, he's always been after you. From the womb, even in eternity when he created you, he wanted always the best for you. He always wanted heaven for you. He always wanted healing for you. He always wanted you to be great. So our standards of what we should want in our lives and expectations of what we should have hit by now or age, like by this age, I should have had this many children or by this age, I should have had my doctorate or by this, you start setting yourself up for failure and guilt. And how about is 
that when you wake up, it's like, have I done what God has wanted me to do? Our standard can never supersede what God wants. Our standards, our expectations can never supersede what God expects from you, his will, his word, his purpose in your life. Your standards, human standards can never supersede his because you will live in a state of guilt. Shame will possess you and you will speak from shame at all times. Shame, we're going to read on that too. Shame, the spirit of shame produces an internal feeling that we are grossly and unbearably flawed as a person. I don't know about you, but even I have felt it. Like, I don't know about you, but sometimes like, my God, I'm such a failure. I failed at this. You start changing from I failed at this to I'm a failure. You now changed your identity because you have left the spirit of shame take over in your life. So now your identity has changed from I made one mistake to now I wear that as an identity. We've done it to murderers. We've done it to people who have done bad things on this earth. Instead of being a person who murdered, we changed them to, oh, that's the murderer. That's the liar. That's the robber. We start calling people by what they did and then we change their identity. So now they wear shame and guilt as part of their identity from what they did instead of having that one mistake, that one sin, that one error not be part of their identity. We have learned to be a culture that changes people's lives to what they do. So you are judged by what you do. You're not an apostle. You're not a doctor that does some amazing works. You're the doctor, what, that that had malpractice. So now you're a malpractice doctor. Somebody who has saved a million lives but wound up maybe hurting one. One bad day can change your identity. One bad moment. Just trying to get you to understand that this is what guilt and shame do. It makes us then speak of ourselves. We self-condemn. We don't need anybody's help. I don't know about you, but I don't need anybody's help to hurt myself. Like, I'm not like sitting here cutting, but what I'm saying is I don't need anybody's help. I can cut myself with my own words. Like, there's been times where... People, oh my God, I'm stupid. I did that. You know, like I remember college days. My God, what's wrong with you? And it's like hitting my head. Like if hitting my head was going to shake my brain into some activation of being smart all of a sudden. And it was just that I didn't understand. And I had to be taught differently or I had to figure out how to learn that would work for me. But that one moment changed me into adopting confusion and deaf and dumb and saying, I'm not smart. I'm not cut out for this. This is not me. Yet in my older age, I can honestly say I got a really high GPA, almost a 4.0. I also pray for that because my heart is not healed. I need that 0. 0.10. But in, the, in college, when I was young and had all the time in the world, I had a 1.96. When we get it, we get it. And when we don't, we don't. And, and it didn't change my identity and who I was. But at that moment, it did. Because I let it. This shame, the spirit of shame, it seduces us into believing that we are inadequate, that we're bad, that we're no good. These feelings impede the maximization of potential and the fulfillment of purpose. It seduces you. Like if you think seduction, seduction, we always think of like sexualized things or intimacy or something like that. But in reality, the spirit of shame will seduce you to believe that you are no longer good, that you're, you are bad, that you are inadequate. And that's what the spirit comes to do. These feelings will impede you from growth. In some people, it can result in low self-esteem or concept of self. Shame can involve even family secrets, personal failures, and poor self-image. A person that was created in the image and likeness of God cannot be inadequate. You were created in the image of God. He said, let us create them in our image. Let us. That means we look like our father. We look like the son. We look like the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying physically. I'm saying we, we were created to have their likeness. 
but we don't believe it. How many of you believe that you are like the father, that you were created truly in his image and that you have the likeness of the father. You have the likeness of Jesus Christ. You have the likeness of the Holy Spirit. You say yes, but one bad moment happens and all that's right out the window. Your speech declares something else because what's in your heart is different than what's being vocalized. Sin. And you can find that type of stuff in 2 Samuel 13, 1 through 2 and 14 through 20 as verses. We needed that for reference in reference to the spirit of shame. And sin, because we talked about guilt, shame, and sin. And you is shaka from the root chaka, and it is um the meaning of this is to miss the mark. It's to miss the mark. To sin is to miss the mark. That means something is off target as it relates to God in your life. Therefore, sin is the transgression of any laws of God. Whoever committed sin transgresses against the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is just anything against the law of God. If the word says thou shalt not do this and you're doing it, that's sin. Thou shalt not lie and you lie, that's a sin. It doesn't make you a liar. It means that you have sin with the sin of lying. So what do you have to do? We have to speak right. We have to get our hearts right. We have to get our minds right. We have to get our mouths right. He recognized that he was a man of unclean lips. Do you recognize your insecurities? Do you recognize the shame that you have worn like a badge of honor? Do you recognize the guilt? Do you recognize the sin that's part of your life? If we live and speak our guilt, shame, and sin, we're missing the mark because we choose to believe in our hearts and our mouths that we're not forgiven. And the other thing we believe, if we continue to always live in a state of speaking of shame, guilt, and sin, then we don't believe that Jesus dying on the cross and resurrecting was enough. You don't believe his resurrection and his death or his death and resurrection are enough. Because if you're still speaking and wearing an identity that you no longer have, then the cross was not enough for you. Then what can help you? If Jesus can't help you, who can help you? I want you to hear this, and it's how he spoke it to me. Vocalizing what was burned off is a sin against God. So whatever he burned off your life, if you continue to vocalize it over and over and over again, you are sinning against God. Because he forgave it, and you keep bringing it up. He sent his son to die for you, and you keep vocalizing sin. His son died for all your sins. He died for all your shame. He died for all your sickness. But you keep vocalizing everything that was burned off, everything that he died on the cross for, you keep vocalizing. So either you didn't accept the Lord as your Lord and Savior, or you don't even believe that you're, you're freed, that you're saved. You don't believe it. Or you just don't believe that, that he's powerful enough to forgive little old people, little old man. When we vocalize it, what was burned off, we depower the resurrection in our lives. We minimize the resurrection in our lives. He says, share the good news. What's good about your shame and your guilt and your sin? that you've worn. What's good about that? What's the good news? What's good about your sin that you keep wearing? What's good about the shame you keep wearing? What's good about all, all this guilt that you're walking with to this day? What's the good news about that? How are you going to win everybody, anybody or everybody to Christ when all you speak is sin, guilt, and shame? He freed you from all those things, but you keep talking about shame and depression like they're yours. You ever hear people say, my depression. Like they bought a phone and now it's yours. 
Depression is not something you take ownership of. When have you taken ownership of the Holy Spirit? My Holy Spirit. My spirit of love. My spirit of sound mind. My healing. My healer. When have you taken ownership of everything that is good and stay, instead of saying my anxiety, my fear, my depression, you live in a state of speaking everything that's oppositional to Jesus Christ. And when have you walked around saying my Holy Spirit? my comforter, my love, my sound of mind, my healing. I don't walk around saying my depression. It's not mine. It's the enemy's. It's meant to destroy me. No one who has ever battled depression said they felt great during it. No one. When you have the power of the Holy Spirit and you feel the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life, you say, my Holy Spirit, my comforter, I am light, I am soft, I feel great, I am healed, I am whole, I am saved, I am walking in confidence before the throne of grace, I walk with boldness, I walk with joy, I put on joy, I put on love, I have every thought held captive to the obedience of Christ. There's a difference in how you feel. There's a difference in how you feel when you embrace everything that God is in you and through you. And when your speech is transformed, that means your heart has been transformed as well. Your mind, your heart, your mouth all should speak glory. And I'm not saying that. What I've learned, I had to train myself. I use Dr. Caroline Leaf's methods. I, I even trained myself to, to leave thinking, what are like five things that were positive? What are 10 things that are positive from like any given place that I went to? We were in a, a ministry that was very hard at one point, and all I could see was the bad. And the Lord spoke to me even then because, of, you know, we're all in our healing journey. And the Lord said, what are 10 things that were good about that service? Because it's easy to find the bad, especially when you've taken ownership of everything that's bad. It's made it yours. But how about, wow, that, that one song is amazing. The pastor, that, that one verse he read just really ministered to me. And you start deliberately changing even the neuroplasticity of your mind and your speech and your heart. And when you fill your mouth and your mind and your heart with the word of God, your speech. You remember that your speech and your mouth has been branded by Jesus Christ himself. Isaiah was branded by an angel. We're branded by the blood of the lamb. What's more powerful than the blood of the lamb? This, we need to vocalize Jesus. He freed you from every spirit. And it says here, he, he gave me something on Micah 7.19, it says, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Do you keep going to the sea? Are you, it's not even like deep sea fishing here, guys. This, the depths of the sea is further down than deep sea fishing. Are you going to a really deep place to fish up your sins and your guilt and even the sins and guilt of other people? What are you doing? How long will you go deep sea fishing for your sins and your guilt? How long will you live there? It's like he throws it in a place that you humanly should not be able to get. In Hebrew, iniquity means avon. It means to bend and twist and distort. Iniquities are a bending, a twisting, a distorting of God's word, his laws. And they're worthy of punishment. But he said, I take all of your iniquities and throw them into the depths of the sea. You shouldn't even be able to find it. And you explain to me why you keep finding it. 
But explain to me why you keep finding all your iniquities. Your speech needs freedom. We live in a country that we have freedom of speech, so we think we can say anything. But in reality, our speech needs freedom. He forgave you of all your sins, but you keep reliving them and speaking about them. Your speech needs freedom. He freed you and forgave you, and you need to share the gospel. Your speech should only be the good news. Stop sharing the past. Stop sharing the sin. Stop sharing the guilt. Those things are gone. Yeah. yeah speech needs freedom. That thing, did, it, it, it hit me hard. You should only be able to speak good news. The Bible says that out of the abundance of your heart does the mouth speak. What's in your if your speech is all shame and guilt and sin, then that's what's in your heart, whether you want to admit it or not. Your heart needs freedom. My heart needs freedom. Not just yours, mine. My memory needs freedom. My subconscious level needs freedom. We don't remember our sins, but we surely do. And we remind him of a sin he has forgiven. We remind him of shame and guilt that he's gotten rid of. And we keep on saying, but Lord, that sin that I committed in 1976, the day that I was born. Like, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. Hold on. Let me remind you. Let me go deep sea fishing, Lord, so I can bring it up from the depths of the sea. And you can remember what you forgave. The heart. In the time of the Bible, it was a part of the body to the Israelites. It wasn't just a part. Like to us, it's a part of our body. But to them, it was more. They had a broader understanding of the heart than we do. The heart as an organ to them meant a physical. And it was the place that you go to think and make sense of the world. Where your feelings and you make choices from your heart. That's why they were able to make melodies from their heart. That's why when they spoke, they spoke from the heart, right? When we hear speak from the heart, hear someone's heart. Because what's in your heart is going to be expressed. What is in your heart? I want you to really examine your heart. What is in your heart is what's reflecting out of your mouth. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move from move you to follow my decrees and keep my laws and be careful to keep my laws. When he gives you a new heart, he gives you new life and he puts a new spirit in you. That means those spirits of shame, the spirit of guilt, all those spirits that you've been battling, depression, oppression, all these spirits are not the spirit he's going to give you. He's going to give you the spirit of love. He's going to give you sound mind. He's going to give you power. He's going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to give you a new anointing. He's going to replenish you. He's going to strengthen you. None of those spirits that I just mentioned were depression and shame, and guilt. None of those were mentioned because that's not the spirit. I mean, unless you can prove through the word that the Lord himself gives you bad spirits, please tell me that he wants you to live in shame and guilt. He's not, there's nothing bad in the Holy Spirit. He's a comforter. He guides us to all truths. In Revelations 21, 5, it said, and he who was seated on a throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. As Christians, we can trust that God will keep his word. We can trust his words. You can trust every single word of the living word. Every single word in there. You can trust it. 
he will lead you even in the words that like Leviticus and some of those things that are really strict, right? But even in those words, he will teach you what happened to those people. And he will teach us even how to live through his words. He said, these words are trustworthy and true. I make all things new. That means he didn't make some things in your life new. He didn't choose to make your, your mind new and leave your heart right with the past. He didn't make your mind new and said, well, I'm going to leave her mouth as is. Listen, my mouth gets me in trouble. I didn't even feel like I was the appropriate one to preach this. I really wasn't. I was like, Lord, you've got to pick a better one. This is not it. Can we pick a fluffy message? No, that wasn't it. Let's work on your words, Liz Martinez. So this message hit here and is still hitting here before I can even speak it to you. These words, what are he gave us a mind. He gave us a new heart. He gave us new lives. He gave us new words. He gives us a new family. He gives us a new home. And the thing is, it's new for us because we never recognize that heaven has always been our home. Because we're trying to make a home here that we don't belong in. We are here, but we're not of it. You're not of the earth. So if you can speak the words that you're supposed to be speaking from eternity down, you would not be trying to fit in on an earth that you're made to stand out in. He is doing a new thing, but you can only have the new when you stop the old. You don't go to the promised land with the speech of it, Egypt. You don't, but in Egypt, we did it like this. Yeah, but in Egypt, you were bound. But in Egypt, we did this like that. Well, yeah, but in Egypt, you were slain. We need to stop going back to, but what we did in this ministry or but what we did there or what we did in this family, it doesn't matter. We've given you a new family. He's given you a new home. The new home that you think is new has always been your destiny, has always been your place. Stop speaking Egypt when you need to speak the promised land. Second of Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the question today is, are you in Christ? It's the question before you. Are you in Christ? The new creation has come. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. This moment, the new is here now. Not next week, not in two years. It is now. Your speech will be changed. Your mindset will be changed. Your heart would be changed. Your goals. I was going to be an investment person forever. And he said, leave that and follow me. He said, let it go. Follow me. And I went from certain goals that I had that I was going to retire at this age and do this and do that. No, none of that. And then I was like, okay, I might attain having half my income or even getting to my income once again. Nah, I've never attained half my income that I had in investments ever in the last decade. It's humbling. It's humbling. But then he's provided. I have more now in the natural than I had when I had all the money. I prefer God. I prefer God. I prefer love. I prefer not to be in depression. I prefer not to be suicidal. I prefer not to be an addict to prescription drugs. I prefer this life now. I prefer that depression is not mine. Depression is of the devil. And I was there for a very long time. And I took ownership. I wore depression like it was something to be proud of. Because nowadays it's like, I'm, I'm battling depression. You too? Oh my God. Like, it's like, we're going to go hang because we're all depressed. It's, it's not fun. <laughs> it's not something to go hang out and have dinner over. 
But man, is it amazing to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ and be like, I have Jesus Christ. I have the power of resurrection living in me and through me. I have love. I have grace. I have favor. I need more fruits of the spirit. I have Jesus. I have nothing but Jesus. Sounds weird, but it's amazing. The old has gone. The new is here. Why are we speaking the old? In a new place. Ecclesiastics 3.11. It says God has set eternity. In the heart. Of mankind. Eternity is right there. You know how they set. A diamond in a ring. It's a careful process. Right. They set something in a ring. That's a process. You have to shape it. You have to make sure it fits. Your heart may be bigger than mine. My heart may be littler. My bowels may be in different places because maybe something happened. You know, something may be going on. But the reality is set eternity. Where you belong, your home, where your home is, is here. Why are we speaking anything other than eternity? He set eternity. I, I see it. If you close your eyes, I want you to just imagine this with the Holy Spirit. Father, just give them imagination to see this. That he takes a diamond, but he and, and like imagine that diamond being eternity. As precious as eternity is, as valuable as it is. And he takes, I'm going to set it in their hearts. Eternities there, eternities in Jackie's, Wani's, Kelsey's, um, Jody, um, Jada, Pastor Angel, Jen, Karina, Catherine. Eternity, he placed it right there, and he said, "Okay, I gotta like wiggle it in to get it into the right spot." And he sets it in there, and then he's looking at it, going, "Because when when you imagine, a, look how beautiful it is afterwards. You're like, wow." The masterwork, the masterwork of the person setting eternity in your heart. It's beautiful. He set it there rightfully so because it belonged nowhere else. Because what he set in your heart should be the only thing you can speak. That's deep. That's the Lord. It's amazing. He has made everything appropriate in its time. And he set eternity in your heart. That's the thing. He set everything you would need. He set to your home. He set speech that you should have all in your heart. You were destined and created for heaven. You were destined to speak of your heavenly home. You can't go anywhere until the burning happens. Burning has to take away all of that guilt. The cross has to take it all away. Then you can go. We recognize that we have some areas that we have to still work on. I do. I don't know about you, but I do. I definitely do. I still have some areas that I'm like, oh my God, I've, I've been sent before I should be. And that's my mindset. But the reality is, who am I to tell Jesus that his, the cross wasn't strong enough to, to continue to work on my attitude, to continue to work on that, that thorn that's there, on the words that come out of my mouth, on the mindset sometimes, on the sins? Because we don't want to admit that any of us sin. I don't know about you. I just may sin differently. You may not. I don't know. You may have it down pat. And if you do, please share it with me. I'm not even being sarcastic about it. Share it with me because if you have a different back, I need I, your apostles asking for help. Matthew 12, 34 through 45. I'm going to read it all. Listen to this. It says, you brought of vipers. How can you who are evil say anything good? For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings up evil things out of the evil stored up in him. 
But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every empty word that they have spoken. Every single one of us. That, that empty word many times, but up until this sermon, it didn't hit me. How many times I'm laughing and I'm like, oh, I'm dead. Oh my God, I'm dead. I'm dead. Like I've died a thousand times just laughing. And that's my speech on just laughing. Oh my God, I'm laughing to death. LOL, laughing and, and put like dead emojis. I'm like, oh God, I, I've got to repent from start to finish in, in a life because you don't realize that these empty words mean something. You're declaring death even in a joke over yourself. Trust me, this, this message hit me hard. For by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. First words that declare death upon our lives. What is stored up in you is what you will bring out. But you, by your words, you will be acquitted. If we can just change our words, we will be acquitted. I don't want to be questioned on judgment day. The words that I've spoken, if I can change it now. Can we change our words now? Yeah, we can. The Bible says in Psalm 119, 11, I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. He has set eternity, and now we're hiding his words in our hearts that we won't sin against him. Are you hiding? Are you treasuring? And it's not hiding physically, taking the word, hiding it. It's more like, is it precious enough to you, the word of God, that you're putting it into your heart, that you're speaking it over your life, that you're putting it in, that what you have stored up in your heart, that what you treasure is what you're speaking. He doesn't even want you to have the ability to speak of your shame and guilt that you have taken in. So what are you speaking? What are you saying? I'm going to read this again. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. Two, they covered their feet, and two, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, see, this has touched your lips. And your guilt has been taken away and your sins atoned for. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Number one, Isaiah saw the his eyes never were impeded. Number two, then he recognized his unclean lips and living among people with unclean lips. Number three, the angel comes and touches his mouth with the burning coal. Number four, guilt is taken away. Number five, sin is atoned for. Number six, a question by the Lord. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Number seven, here I am, send me. The commissioning of Isaiah the prophet, and today the commissioning for all of us, imperfections, guilt, sin, and everything has kept you from doing the great commission. No longer is it a simple commission like Isaiah, but it is the great commission. That means there's a greater responsibility. At that time, it was, but this time it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. The commissioning in churches has become so uh, official and religious 
all kinds of papers, all kinds of credentials. The commissioning of Isaiah was a burning coal and two questions. Here I am, send me, or is it excuses? Is it empty words? Is it shame? What is it that's impeding you from saying, here I am, send me? Mark 16, 15, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nation, all creation. Today, he cleans your heart. He cleans your mouth. I want us to understand that what he's telling us, don't invalidate, don't belittle, don't devalue, don't depower the death and resurrection of Christ with your lips. Will you share the good news? Or are you deep sea fishing in the depths for guilt and shame that is no longer yours? Father, we thank you and we bless you. We thank you. I ask you to reveal to our hearts, our speech and our hearts. Examine our hearts today. Examine us and see if there be any wicked ways in us that we're speaking and what we stored up in our hearts is just not right. We keep on going and living from a place of shame, guilt, and sin. We have made it part of our identity. And I ask you today, Father God, that we truly receive the revelation that we are your daughters, we are your sons, we are your children, that just as with Isaiah, you burned his lips. You branded him with the coal and said, your sin is atoned for, your guilt is no longer with the blood of the lamb and the cross, Father God. Today, we understand that we have been marked by the blood of the lamb. We have been stained white as snow. Anything and everything we think that can be seen by man cannot even be seen by you. You have thrown it in the depths of the sea and we will no longer go deep sea fishing for a sin not forgiven, for a sin we're supposed to be incapable of getting. Forgive us for reliving it. Forgive us for making it part of our identity. Forgive us for speaking something that we shouldn't even be able to access. It's we won't be those that you ask the question, who will I send? Who will go for us? All of heaven is asking, who will go for us? There's too many people dying on this earth, Lord. And we're so focused on self and our insecurities and our shames and our guilt and our sins and labeling ourselves a sinner instead of a saint, labeling ourselves bad when we are good. We are your children. We are daughters. We are sons and daughters. We are royal priesthood. We are above and not beneath. We are the head and not the tail. We don't understand who we are. And I ask you that the eternity that you have set in our hearts, that it come forth today, that it will shine bright, truly, like, like that the our hearts will be the bring forth our mouths, every vain word, even myself that I have spoken, every word that's not like you, every curse, everything that we have stated that is not like you, Father God, that we truly repent and we sin no more, that we don't invalidate the power of death and resurrection, that we no longer speak from a place of guilt and shame, but we speak of forgiveness. You heal us, you save us, you make us whole. And we say, we know that your blood has power, more power than anything, more power than depression, more power than death, more power than anything. Your blood is more powerful. And today and from here on and teach us how to go into Psalms and read prayers that, that heal us, prayers that forgive us, prayers that keep us on track with speaking your words because we're going to treasure your word and put it in our hearts, put it in our bellies. We're gonna eat manna, we're gonna drink the living waters. We're gonna consume and drink the body and the blood and understand and receive full revelation, not human knowledge. Remove all human knowledge of your words and reveal yourself to us today that we receive the full understanding and revelation of what you meant when you branded Isaiah with the coal 
when you forgave him, when you healed us by your blood, what does that mean? That out of the abundance of our hearts, from here on in, we can only speak of you. We can only speak life, that we will feel the conviction from the heart to the mouth, and we will change. We will hold that thought captive. We will not just release it without filtering it through the Holy Spirit, because you've branded us. You've marked us. Every single one of us is marked by the blood of the Lamb. And we know that all things are new. The old has passed. We receive the revelation. We don't just say it. Okay, he forgave us of our sins, but the shame that I have for yesterday is still so evident because yesterday was past, but today we brought it into the new day. Even though you brought new mercies into this new day, your mercies are new every day. We brought the shame of yesterday. To forgive us. Forgive us for bringing in what happened yesterday into today and not receiving the new mercies because we don't even believe that your mercies can be new every day. Forgive us of our unbelief right now. Forgive us of our unbelief. Forgive us of the unbelief in your power and resurrection. Forgive us in the power of your words. Forgive us that it is a living word and not just a book to us. We receive the living words. And we release the living words from here on in. Father God, tame our tongue. We will speak life. The power of death and life are in the tongue. I repent for every word that I have spoken of death over myself. And even just joking and even in speech, even when I'm angry, Lord, I will speak life. Help me, Lord. I use this power incorrectly. I do not want to declare. I do not want to speak shame. I do not want to speak death. I do not want to speak sickness. I want to speak life and healing and holiness and the blood. I want to speak of my heavenly home because this is not my home. I'm not making the most beautiful home here because I have the most beautiful home. I have a mansion. I have streets of gold. That is my home. I was created for heaven. And I understand and receive the full revelation. Speak to our lives. That we no longer can speak death. We no longer can speak death. Holy Spirit, convict us to speak right. Every single one of us. And I repent that as a leader, many times, Lord, I don't even speak right. And many times I'm sarcastic and, and, and that is a form of anger. Please forgive me, Lord. Forgive me of, of any words and all words that are just not like you, that they don't produce life. Help me. Help us all. Because we have words. We have to share the good news. We have a great commission before us and we have a responsibility and a duty to do what you have called us to do. And we to the Great Commission, and we will share the good news, not bad news. We will share the good news of Jesus Christ. From here on in, we will speak of Jesus. What do you want from me? I got nothing but Jesus Christ. Nothing but Jesus. Father, that we, we take on the Great Commission, and we say, here I am send me, but that we're ready from our speech, from our heart, from our minds, from our hearts, that we are totally all in to what you say. We declare this in Jesus' name.